it's really changed the game in that um, it's f because people really like the short videos, whether it's YouTube shorts or Facebook reels or Instagram reels or TikToking, whatever. Um, people love quick information, like 30 seconds or a minute, whatever, max. Um, and I always liken it to like, it's just flicking the channels. You just swipe and you send new fully, you know, you watch something for 30 seconds, like you'd flick a channel, only you get a full thing. And then it's the next thing you flick the channel, you flick the channel. Um, but for a teacher, I find it really fascinating because my challenge is like, well, can I teach a concept or get someone to like learn something in 15 or 20 seconds? How long have you been a dentist? <laughs> if, if you if you Google Matt Warnock, it's true that you may find a lawyer of the same name, an Australian footballer even, uh -huh. or a dentist with the same name. He is a doctor, but his doctorate is in music, not dentistry. <laughs> Matt has developed a web presence as one of the biggest online jazz ed educators worldwide. We'll have to talk about how he grew his jazz education empire in a bit. <laughs> He's lived in the US, Brazil, and the UK at different times. Oddly enough, even though we both grew up in the same area, which is Sault Ste. Marie in Northern Ontario, Canada, we never knew each other until many years later. Mm -hmm. Matt, thank you for doing this interview. No problem. Thanks for having me. And just, I, I think there's also a, a football coach in England named Matt Warnock, but I, I could be wrong. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't dig that deep into Google to find out. It was just the first like three that popped up. <laughs> I understand that you're back living in Sault Ste. Marie. Yeah, I've been gone since I left in 98, moved to Montreal uh, for school at McGill. And uh, most recently was living in Tucson, Arizona. Okay. Um, and uh, in 2020, when they closed the borders and then we couldn't see our families, my wife's family's from Wisconsin and um, all my family lives in the Sioux. Uh, my brothers moved back and everything and all their families. So when they closed the border, we kind of realized we're, we're cut off from our family. <laughs> this isn't very cool. So we didn't get to see my family or my side of the family for over two years, two and a half years or so. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at that point, we're like, you know what, we should go live closer to family. Um, and right. my wife's family is just on the other side of, of the UP in, in Wisconsin by Green Bay. So it's a short drive. And yeah. so we decided to move back. And luckily enough, like, you know, like you mentioned, I work online is the Sioux just finished, like it was just before we moved in, but they just finished putting in fiber optic internet in every house in the Sioux. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, That's so something that I, I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> no. And because uh, we had wanted to move back previously, but the internet here was not uh, up to speed. <laughs> right. Literally. Yeah, um, literally. And they yeah. Put, yeah. And when they put fiber in, it's now some of what well, it's the fastest internet I've ever experienced uh, nice. anywhere. So it's great. Yeah. I can do like we have multiple Zoom calls going all the time and like all sorts of cool stuff. And for transferring files and video and audio rendering and everything, it's great. So now is that through Bell Canada or? Yep, it's Sweet okay. Bell. Uh, I think it's called Fibe. And uh, we get about uh, 1.5 gigs up and down even, which is really good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I remember yeah. uh, back before I even moved to Toronto to, to uh, go to college is that I was working in construction and I was putting in fiber optic cable way mm. back then because they were planning this yeah. way back then. That would have been 1987. Yeah, and what they didn't end up doing is they put all the, the cables in, but they didn't put the end parts in, like the boxes at the end, yeah. and that's what they had to go and do all of that. And then yeah. once they did that, and it's it's pretty amazing. And well, so, I was uh, one of the guys installing the fiber optic <laughs> cable way back I'll, then. I'll, I'll have to send you a thank you card every time I turn on my internet, <laughs> just lightning fast, you know? <laughs> yeah, and it was it's hard cable to work with because it's what what's uh, what it's made out of. It's not made out of copper like your regular telephone no. cable. It's 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 glass. Yeah. Inside. Yeah. It's very tricky, but, uh, they finally got it up here and we've, we've modernized the, the communications up in Northern Ontario and nice. And so it, yeah, so it was finally feasible to, to live here and we both work online. And so, um, yeah, that just made the sort of decision easier to come up here and we're tired of, you know, 120 degree summers <laughs> every day. On an <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what brought you to Arizona in the first place? Um, we were living in England, in the northwest of England. Uh, we lived in Manchester and then a city called Chester, which is just by Liverpool. And it rains almost every day and it's cold and windy. And, and you got tired of the sun. Chesters. 
<laughs> yeah. Both Chesters. And, exactly. And so uh, we had really good friends in, um, in Tucson. And uh, because we can both work and live in both countries, US and Canada, because of our citizenships, we decided to um, go live somewhere warm and sunny for a while. And we thought we'd live for maybe a year or two and ended up being uh, s almost seven years, I think we were there. Wow. For. Okay. Six, six that's, years, six and a half, something like that. Yeah. That's about right around the time that I, that we kind of lost touch with each other a little bit, like right after you probably moved back from the UK. I think so. Yeah. I think I, I think then, I have yeah. a vague memory of like emailing you thinking that you were still in the UK and you were like, <laughs> you just moved back or something. And then yeah. I, we hadn't talked for years yeah things got life gets busy huh it's amazing it, how, it, how that goes <laughs> it does yeah i want to talk to you about your your journey to what got you to where you are now musically and where where you are living physically now but you kind of mentioned that a little bit about that already so let's talk about the uh the musical part like how did you get started um, well, I got started just down the road at the Algoma Conservatory, uh, where I started taking uh, piano lessons as like a six year old or something like that. And uh, I went to the conservatory a bit and I went to a local neighbor's house who taught uh, piano out of their home. Right. Um, him and his wife taught piano and voice and organ and stuff. So I went there as well. And then in, uh, in grade 10 uh, in Canada at the time, we had guitar classes. And so uh, Mark, I don't know if you know Mark Goff, but he taught guitar here. Um, at Sir James Dunn and uh, I was just going to ask room. you where you went <laughs> yeah I went to the Dunn and so you were on uh, the hill and... you went to school on the hill there I don't I think the, the the school <laughs> the doesn't gone. exist anymore right no they tore it down and they moved it to it they brought two schools they brought uh Bawading and Sir James Dunn two high schools together okay. uh, where Bawading was and they tore the old schools down so my high school is no longer there <laughs> but in the field that's there now that's where I learned how to play guitar and it was in a guitar class and Mark was great and he got me started and really sort of excited about playing and it was hum and strum stuff, but I really enjoyed it with some finger picking things, some instrumentals. Um, you know, I remember learning some like instrumental Stevie Ray Vaughan and, you know, even some Fleetwood Mac stuff that was really cool with finger picking that got me excited. Um, and then in 12th grade, I, um, I got into a class. There was one year when they had a jazz band at Sir James Dunn. And it was run by Val Suriano, who was a sax player who lived here for many right. years. And, who I yeah. found out about late, much later, but was kind of like a jazz legend because that was before jazz was ever on my radar. Yeah. And he was here and then he went to Sudbury and came back here and then he went to Ottawa. And unfortunately, he passed away just a couple of years ago. Um, he was pretty young too. But, um, but he started this, this class and he had about 20 kids like, you know, playing grunge guitar all day long and all of a sudden he's like let's play charlie parker <laughs> we were like okay <laughs> and we would do these concerts and stuff and we did three or four concerts throughout the year and uh play, reading down charts and stuff and that got me really pumped about it and so um i was kind of planning on doing classical guitar for a living at the time i was gonna go to school for it and be a teacher or player or whatever and uh as soon as I started playing in the jazz band, I was done. I was done with classical guitar. I remember trading in my classical for a Fender amp and a Strat and being like, <laughs> I'm going this way now. <laughs> yeah. um, nice. Well, that's probably and, a good thing. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, you know, I, I still play finger style. So all that classical training comes in handy, um, yeah. literally. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, but then I, I got into uh, jazz and I ended up uh, moving to Montreal and living there for two years, doing like a general music degree at McGill um, and then Vanier College. I did their uh, sort of they had a one year intensive jazz program just to sort of go in and do jazz full time for a year and see if I really liked it. And then, uh, yeah, I, I loved it. Ended up going to McGill and then Western Michigan and U of I. Um, and that sort of took, you know, put my career path uh, set there. And then uh, and University yeah, I, of Illinois is where you got your doctorate. That's where I finished. Yeah. So I got my doctorate and, um, I used to teach, I've taught at a bunch of different universities and colleges in uh, Canada and the, and the UK or sorry, the U S and the UK. And, um, I did that, uh, for many years until about, uh, 2014, 2015. And then I just decided to do the online thing full time. So I've been doing it kind of part time for a few years and then things kind of took off with the online school and everything. And I just thought, well, I'm kind of done having a boss and, <laughs> and that right. sort of thing. So I went into that. Um, and along the way, I've done a lot of touring and performing and, uh, and yeah, just playing our gigs and 
you know, playing and teaching at the same time, which I really enjoy doing both. So. Right. What type of gigs were you, have you been doing since, especially moving back to the USA? Um, when, well, when, after, to, after UK. So after I moved back from the UK, um, I did some gigs around Arizona. And then of course, COVID hit <laughs> uh, shortly after, because I was doing the, the online stuff a lot. I was doing like, even before COVID happened, I was doing a lot of online teaching, uh, well, doing only online teaching and playing. And so I was doing like online performing before that was like a thing, before everyone was kind of forced to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So I started to explore that when I was in Arizona. And then of course, when COVID hit, I got much more into that, uh, into sort of playing online and doing the virtual stuff. Um, and now that we're coming out of the other side of it, um, I just did my first in-person concert post COVID like uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago with Roddy Elias. We did a duo and a great young jazz player here in the Sioux called Jake Valois, who joined us. And we did a tribute to Wes Montgomery. It was his hundredth birthday that weekend. And so we right. played and um, yeah, it was great. So I'm getting back out now and doing more in-person stuff. Um, but I, for a long time, I was doing like the online virtual performing and, and teaching and that sort of thing. Okay, cool. Well, maybe since you brought up the, uh, the online teaching aspect, I wanted to talk to you about your, your website, uh, MWG courses mm -hmm. and how, how did that grow into what it, it's become t today? Well, it started in 2011. Um, at the time I moved to Brazil, uh, to play and teach there. And, um, I had a bunch of free time cause I was a college professor up until that point. And I was touring a lot and playing a lot and traveling and I was really busy. And I, all of a sudden I moved to Brazil and was like, well, my gigs are down the street and <laughs> I teach over there and I have a lot of free time. So I decided just to launch the website. Just, I had no idea what it would turn into or what I would do with it. I just thought it was a nice project. Mm -hmm. um, I was really interested in kind of the online teaching realm and um, magazines and blogs and that kind of thing back then. So yeah, so I, I launched it. And uh, within a few weeks, I had people ask me for Skype lessons. And so I started teaching on Skype. And then I did this series um, very quickly, maybe six months into it, it was like a free blog series of 30 lessons called 30 days to better jazz guitar. And then I had someone email me and say, I'd love to have all 30 of those in a PDF. If you do that, I'll buy it from you. And I just thought, Oh, this is a business. Okay. Now the business started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, I, I had no intention of doing it. Just people asked me for Skype lessons or asked me for, to buy the, you know, put stuff into PDFs and buy it. I thought, okay, this is great. I can do this for a living. It's weird and how so, that happens, right? Like it's, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the plan. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and so I quickly got uh, a bunch of Skype students, um, and I started writing eBooks and then the, the site kept growing and the original site was called Matt And that morphed into MWG courses in about 2019. So what eight years, it was the old site. Um, and the old site, we had about 11 million guitarists use the site over those eight years, which is very cool. There's a big reach. Um, a lot of people um, were using the free lessons and buying the eBooks and, and taking Skype lessons. And then in 2019, that's when we kind of decided that, um, again, people were asking more for video courses and more for things with, you know, like at the time that was the big thing. It was eBooks were kind of going away and it was more about interactive video and courses and that kind of stuff. So we transitioned over into the MWG courses site and we launched the courses and that transitioned into a membership about a year later where people can either buy a course and they can just check it out um, one at a time or they can join the membership and have access to everything plus the members community, which is very interactive with me um, and that sort of thing. So yeah, so it, it kind of transitioned slowly over time. Um, but those are the two big or the three big iterations was the original Matt Warnock guitar site, which is free lessons and eBooks. And then I went into the courses site in about 2019 and then transferred into the membership um, in about 2020, 2021 ish. And along the way in 2017, I started a Facebook group called play jazz guitar. And that quickly grew into about 26, 27,000 people were in there. Um, and we did daily lessons and we did like, uh, we learned a tune of the month. So every month we would learn a new jazz standard and we did live video workshops and stuff. And that's, what's been transitioned out to the membership is I gotten off of Facebook and sort of put that, um, daily lessons, interactive workshops, tune of the month. That's all in the membership now. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So we kind of got that off of Facebook's platform and onto our own, which is nice. And, and so. maybe when we're done, I'll have to pick pick your brain on some of that stuff because I've, <laughs> sure. I've had I've had that in mind to do something like that for the last several years. Cool. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> on to the interview. <laughs> now, I, I, I was going to ask you about the performance at uh, the loft, I think it's called, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is yep. through the Algoma Conservatory where you first started taking lessons. Mm -hmm. Although I think it's moved, right? Yeah. So the conservatory used to be by the university here. And it was in these old annexes, these like sort of portable buildings behind the university. Um, and then they got some grant money, I believe, of uh, I don't know how long ago it would have 10, 12 years ago, maybe longer. And they bought, uh, I don't know if they bought it, they rented it. I think they bought it, an old St. Mary's paper building uh, down by the river here. It used to and be Abitibi, yeah. Yeah, Cause, yeah, exactly. Because my, my grandfather used to work there. And then so ah, did my brother, cool. actually. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, so, so those buildings now, some of them have been turned into like restaurants and bars and concert venues. And then the one main, the admin building, which used to be the admin for St. Mary's paper, is now where the conservatory is and the top level used to be where they stored all their files and stuff and it was called the loft and so they turned that top floor into just a remarkable performance venue i mean the acoustics and the sound are incredible they've got i don't even know how many robotic cameras put in like to film i mean i think they had 12 going at once and they were filming us at all different angles and they're moving all on these sort of tracks and everything, which is very cool. I heard it got... was very high tech and very cool. Cause oh, I was yeah, going to yeah. ask you about that um, as well. Yeah. It's a great place to record and to play. They've got a, a amazing board, um, uh, sound board. I got from a, a studio in Miami, a uh, very famous studio down there. And they bought this board from them and had it shipped up and, um, yeah, so it's, it's very high tech and it just lucked out with the angles of the roof in this. Cause it's like an A-frame that the sound is incredible. There's not a bad seat in the house. You can hear it perfectly everywhere and there's no a ping or echo or anything on stage. And um, it's very, very intimate. I think we had, for the concert we sold out, it was like 175 people, I think. Um, and they have a bar there and a restaurant and stuff that you can check out. And uh, yeah, it's very cool. So we were the first jazz concert because they were supposed to open it up the year before. And then the sort of third wave of COVID or fourth wave, whatever it was, came and they had to shut down. So they reopened earlier that, uh, this year, or la late last year. And then, uh, yeah, we were the first jazz concert in there, which was great. And it was great to see. I saw a lot of people I grew up with and <laughs> hadn't seen in 20 some years and nice. that were there listening. Yeah, it was very cool. And it's great to see all the support in a, in a smaller northern community for jazz. I mean, people were enthusiastic and they knew a lot about, you know, West Montgomery. When I was talking to them afterwards, they were a lot of big fans of Wes and stuff. And it's, yeah, very I'm cool. surprised about that. But that was probably a really good angle that you, you, you put on the concert by focusing on the West Montgomery. I'm sure that made it more aware to people who recognize that name. Yeah, I think so. Um, it was good. Yeah. And then, uh, oddly enough, I have exactly the same birth date as West Montgomery. Oh, is it March 6th at the 6th? That, yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah. I think our so concert that, was the 4th because it was the Saturday, yeah. but it was the same, yeah, same weekend. Yeah, 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 same weekend. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, did, did that concert get recorded? Yeah, it got filmed and recorded. Um, like any sort of school program, I'm sure we'll get it in a year or so because <laughs> they're so, <laughs> so backed up because they record because um, we did a workshop there and they filmed that and recorded all that and that will get stored at the school for students to access and they record and film every concert and they had to go through and edit it and put it all together and stuff so um, I'm looking forward to to seeing it I heard a rough mix after the show they just played a couple seconds for me and it sounded great um, it was nice. really well done so I'm excited for that but it was all recorded all filmed um, and now they'll have to edit it down and put it into a final product but um, yeah, we'll see how long that takes. Usually universities take about six months to a year. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Well, yeah, that's good to know. That's good to know because I, I I, would like to bring some New York cats with me up there and do a performance. Maybe I'll, I'll do a tour or something. Just found out about it in August when I was up there. Oh, about very cool. this really great space. And he's like, I know the guy that, that the, the engineer there and he's yeah, a really Greg cool Nori. guy. Yeah, and yeah. And what was the, what, what was the famous group that he was in? Like the Canadian uh, Trouble rock? Charger. Trouble yeah, Charger. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. They were like a rock group in the eighties and nineties and toured all around and, and right. you know, much music and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I heard he's a, he's a cool dude. 
super cool yeah, yeah. and um I'm going to, I think it's Ben. I'm going to blank. I only met him for a second. Um, who's the, the who's the in charge of all the cameras and the filming. And he was such a cool guy and, uh, yeah, had great ideas and, uh, really did a, a fantastic job. So there's the two of them, Greg, and I think it's Ben, but it was a busy night. I just met him for a second. So if Ben's watching, yeah. I apologize. If it's I'm, ben, but... <laughs> I'm sure you had lots of other things on your brain too. Yeah, like yeah. the, every time, but, uh... at least every time I do a performance, it's not necessarily that I'm nervous but there's some nervous energy there and you want everything to go well and you're excited and whatever so i can understand yeah um, maybe it it's very cool yeah what, what maybe we can come just come back for a second to about your website and stuff like mm -hmm. um for me my my youtube channel and uh my patreon page is kind of more geared towards intermediate players already mm -hmm. do you do you kind of concentrate on more beginners or do you have a full range of yeah it's, people it's, who it's kind a real of full you? range okay. yeah um because whenever we do anything whether it's um, a live workshop like a practice session together um, or we do lessons or the material for the tune of the month or whatever standard we're learning. It's always three levels at least. So there's beginner, intermediate, advanced. Um, we also have study groups inside of the, of the membership. So we have an advanced study group for people who are advanced and want that more material. We're starting a new study group um, for the next three months, April, May, June on reading music. People who are, who are interested in that. So we sort of branch off to into sort of categories and topics of interest or levels that so make sure everyone's sort of covered. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that we do the workshops is different from what I've seen elsewhere is it's, very, it's all interactive. So rather than me talking and playing a, an example and saying, now you go do it, they all have, there's like a hundred people on the screen and they all have their guitars and I play, you know, say, okay, we're going we're gonna to learn this arpeggio or whatever. How do you control the, uh, the, the, well, the well, they're all on so. mute. So I, yeah, okay. so I don't hear them, but they all hear me. Okay. So then we do it where I say, okay, here's the arpeggio. We play it together. Um, so we practice it so that it's not just me sort of showing it like we actually run through some exercises and then I'll comp chords and they'll improvise over the chords. Um, and we'll do that sort of thing. So we're trying to do more interactive play together stuff. So it's not, um, just kind of me talking and, you know, sort of professing my knowledge and then listening. It's more like, okay, let's get together and let's play like they were in the room. And, uh, right. Well, that's, that's, yeah. that's cool. That's more like it's about as close to you can get as a, a, a live workshop, I guess. Yeah. For what, online for now. Yeah. What, so. what software are you using? It's, it's not zoom, is it? Yep. I just use zoom. Okay. Okay. Yep. yep. We use zoom and then, um, the, the website's hosted on two platforms. One's called teachable, what the, the main website. And then for the community where everyone hangs out and people like all my members can upload videos for feedback from me and we do daily lessons and it's very interactive in the, in the community. And that's on a platform called circle, which is like a, like, it's like a Facebook group, but private, um, okay. and you just host it. Yeah. So you have your own, um, URL and it's hosted off of Facebook. It's on like a private server and it kind of acts the same way, you know, as a Facebook group, but, um, yeah, it's just for my members and no one else can see it and that sort of thing, which mm -hmm. is great. Um, and so we do so a lot I of guess stuff in there. Yeah. It's almost like a mix of Facebook and Patreon mixed together or something. Yeah, and Zoom and yeah. YouTube and kind of, yeah, I try to just mix everything that I can, <laughs> that I can all the tools well, I just, that I can use. Yeah. I just meant that Circle platform itself. Oh, yeah, yeah, Circle. Yeah, it's just like that. Yeah, it's, it's like a Facebook group, but um, personalized and private. Uh, which everyone really likes because with the Facebook group we used to have, there was a time around 2019 that I got a lot of people who were just like fed up with Facebook, especially around U S politics and the election and all that kind of stuff on both sides. It didn't matter that people were just kind of fed up. And so I got a lot of people saying, well, I love the group and I love hanging out with everyone in the group, but I'm done with Facebook. And I was like, Oh, this is a problem. <laughs> Everyone's leaving. And, and, and it's so we had to, yeah, go and it's amazing how many uh, Canadians have opinions on on uh, uh, U.S. Uh, politics. <laughs> yeah. It's surprising. And vice versa too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I've some yeah. once in a while I've I've run across things where like, oh, keep your nose out of our American <laughs> politics, you stupid Canadian. That kind of vibe, you know. But although I'm yeah. sweetening the language a little bit. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. 
uh, but so, but yes. but maybe it must be because I don't get into that kind of stuff. The Facebook algorithm doesn't send me that kind of stuff very often. Just once in a while, something might pop up, but I yeah, try to stay to be away worse from before. that. Stuff. Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time there anymore um, on any social media, really. But I, um, yeah, twenty sixteen through twenty twenty. I don't know. You pretty... kind of look like a TikTok guy to me. Oh, I am on TikTok. <laughs> I, 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 no, I, I just mean those. use. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I um I post on all the different platforms and I use it, but um yeah, I I do what's called posting and ghosting. As I post yeah. and then I close it and then I'm gone. Although TikTok is pretty addictive, but yeah, I try to keep away from that. <laughs> yeah, if, so. if I if I'm uh, teaching and I have a spare minute or something, next thing you know, I might find myself on TikTok for a couple minutes and then all of a sudden I'll, <laughs> I'll realize what am I doing? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it hooks you in. <laughs> yeah, so I get yeah. your claws in there, and that's it. Yeah, and that's so. something new for me. I mean, TikTok is very new for me. I just kind of started that up. I still yeah, don't really I, understand it. I just don't. I don't get it. But um, I, I just figured it's idea. another 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 arm of discovery for me is what I'm looking at. Yeah, it's really changed the game in that um, it's because people really like the short videos, whether it's YouTube shorts or Facebook reels or Instagram reels or TikToking, whatever. Um, people love quick information, like 30 seconds or a minute, whatever, max. Um, and I always liken it to like, it's just flicking the channels. You just swipe and just a new fully, you know, you watch something for 30 seconds, like you'd flick a channel, only you get a full thing. And then it's the next thing you flick the channel, you flick the channel. Um, but for a teacher, I find it really fascinating because my challenge is like, well, can I teach a concept or get someone to like learn something in 15 or 20 seconds? And it took me a while to figure that out. And now I think I've got a handle on it. Um, I'm always trying to get better at it and it's always going to be improvements, but it's really a, a, a cool thing. If you can, you know, no fluff, just here's the yep. thing, 20 seconds, learn it, done, move on. Yep. And it's like, wow, okay, this is like actually kind of neat um, and kind of you... cool, but now yeah. since we're both on youtube do you find that that mentality is kind of changing the way you make long form content does it make you sort i don't of... make any any long form content you don't anymore at oh all. okay no i can't compete like there's too many people who were um doing that for too long and because of the way the algorithm works i mean it's really hard for someone to come in and try to take some of that uh yeah. sort of chunk of that viewership out of there so people are already have that established in the long form content but there's no one really established yet in the short form. Um, and so that's what I'm focused on. Okay. It's going where, where things are new and that's all I do. I just do a 15, 20, 30 second video every day posted across my channels and uh, it's, it does really well. I mean, it's, it's surprising. I mean, uh, on a good month, I'll get two and a half, three million views, mm -hmm. um, across my platforms, which I would never get for long form uh, right. video. You know, I can post something on TikTok and get 500,000 views on it, or I might get 500 on a long form video on YouTube. So right. I don't know what that translates into, or if it's good or bad long term. All I know is uh that's the space where everyone's kind of hanging out and i like to go where people are um, yeah and so that's where i'm focusing my attention on right now so. yeah I, I at first i was like i don't know what the heck to do with a short video like i don't I'm, I'm and then i was like well, let me just try it out and then i think now i've gotten a, a little bit better idea and of it like you said that you really gotta just nail it right away get it get onto it and yeah, absolutely one of my best shorts has been taking why well, I filmed with my camera at the same time while I was doing the long form version mm. and I literally edited the whole thing down into 59 seconds yeah and then that and worked it. really really well <laughs> yeah yeah I and don't then, even talk in any of mine I I don't I don't talk. I don't, there's no fluff. It's just, I put tab or notation on the screen if I need it or text. 
people can read because a lot of people when they're doing shorts they're on the, the subway or they're they're they, they just can't listen right they can't right. access the audio so or they're on a lunch break or whatever it might yeah, be. yeah exactly or they're at work sneaking their phone in <laughs> you know? right and so uh yeah i do it with no talking there's words on the screen if people want to read them there's musical examples if they do have audio they can be playing they can listen to it um but they can learn just by looking at the video for 15 20 seconds or 30 seconds whatever and it's a huge challenge, and, but I really like those challenges. I mean, you know, in my career, talking about how I got started, I mean, I was a university professor. I taught thousands of students in person over the years, workshops, individual lessons, whatever. And then making the transition into teaching through a blog originally, I know it's an old yeah. term, but, you yeah. know, teaching through text, that was a huge challenge, but it made me rethink how people learned and, and how to interact with students in a different way. And then that got into then having more audio examples and being able to use images and then having video and all that kind of stuff. And then live video, I did, I've done a lot. I've done, I think the last time I checked, like 500 hours of live video over the years of live workshops. And all that stuff added up to being able to like keep me um, um, just sort of changing with the times, right? So, you know, I, I haven't been rigid in how I teach the material is usually kind of, you know, very similar, how people learn is very similar, but it's the it's the medium that changes. And by adapting to it, I think it's made me a much better teacher. Um, and it's definitely made me more creative in my teaching. Because like, like you were saying, like a lot of people I know, I talked about shorts and stuff, and they were just like, Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. And I was like, oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> cool. <Yeah. laughs> let's, yeah. let's try and figure this out. Um, and that's really, uh, yeah, it just helped me grow as a teacher and made me a better teacher, right? So I always enjoy those challenges, although they're not always easy. <laughs> that's for yeah, sure. well, maybe uh, I, uh, right now my plan is to still continue mainly focusing on long form content, mm -hmm. but definitely I've been seeing since I've been concentrating on more short form stuff lately is that uh, I've been getting a lot of good feedback with them mm -hmm. and your, my, uh, subscriber count has like shoots up every time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, it's, 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 uh, at first, uh, uh, YouTube wasn't good at connecting the shorts with, with the long form content, yeah. but now they're much better at like getting discovered through a short they'll, they'll maybe come visit your 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 channel or whatever yeah absolutely yeah it's it's the future it's where young people want to be and it's it's now you know the way sort of this stuff i've seen work is the young people go somewhere and then the, everyone else follows them <laughs> right and so yeah the short form was like the younger people and now it's becoming everybody and then whatever the young people go to next i'll i'll follow them there and <laughs> and see well, what i can do yeah you know? that's that's smart i don't think things have really changed I think it's always no. been young people <laughs> started something <laughs> yes. or whatever, for, and then other people follow. That's that's just normal. So it's yeah. just really just catching on to it at the right time. That's all. Yeah, and I usually wait a little bit, like a year or so. Like even with the Facebook groups, I think I waited a year to kind of let the kinks get sorted out, and then I dove in really hard on that. And same with the blog and um, with the short form. Like I wasn't on. Yeah, TikTok same here. Facebook shorts right away or YouTube shorts right away. I mean, I waited a couple of years. Yeah, uh, right, a, right away. I was like, well, this is interesting, but let me yeah, just yeah. wait for a bit. Let yeah. me let me like <laughs> see how this is going to play out, because a lot of people were like, oh, man, my watch hours are going down. And and then pump, some people were starting like a whole YouTube channel just for shorts, yeah. you know, because because it was affecting their channel. So like like you said, once it kinks kind of got worked out then i kind of jumped on do you have any hobbies outside of music um yes <laughs> so uh i like to hike that's why we love what well, we love living is in, in tucson because it's one of the hiking capitals of north right. america um, just at at certain times of the day <laughs> in certain times of the year yeah <laughs> you and, and that and too I guess. <laughs> right um but bring we lots of water Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we're out like hiking here, um, every day with the dogs and in the winter we snowshoe, which is great. So we go out snowshoeing with the dogs and go out in the, in the woods here and stuff and, and that sort of thing. So being a Northern kid growing up, I mean, I love the outdoors. So fishing, I don't hunt, uh, but I like fishing, go up to the Lake Superior park and that sort of thing. And spend a lot of time up there. And then, um, 
as far as you know, I, I like reading, and uh, so I read a lot of books. And then when I just want some sort of entertainment or downtime, I play a lot of like NHL hockey on my on my whatever video game system I have. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I'm a huge hockey fan. I guess that's the big thing is watching hockey is probably my biggest thing. Yeah, yeah I watch okay. every least game every year, and yeah, I have for many decades. But well, th yeah. those are two things that I never really got into. Probably uh, was video games or uh least sports as a spectator mm -hmm. i mean i played hockey when yeah, i was a kid you have to because you're canadian yeah. <laughs> yeah. some people ask no me <laughs> yeah some people ask me uh you know is it true that they start you off really young and i go yeah as soon as they pop out of the womb they strap skates onto you, your feet <laughs> <You're> <laughs> you know? right, yeah. it's almost you a helmet and yeah. you got a stick and <laughs> it's, it. it's almost that bad at least it was when i was a kid i don't know what it's like I, now i think it still is yeah it's still pretty intense but uh because we live on a on a street and we're um there's there's mostly young families here and so all year round there's two nets out in front of our house and they're just playing back mm -hmm. and forth and it's car and they move the nets and they put the nets back out in the right car just and they... yeah just like a movie scene or something <laughs> yeah exactly but they're playing 12 months out of the year out there in front of our house cool yeah. not do you but what is your non-music superpower um this is going to sound a little like... strange uh but I would say I, I have ADHD, which some people, I mean, for many people, is a hindrance. Um, and it definitely is for me. <laughs> There's a lot of things, ways that it's, it's hindered me over the years. Um, but my, it given me like, this ability to ultra focus on things when I, can, when I can steer it in the right direction, which isn't always easy. Um, but when I can, I can sit there and put my uh, put a hundred percent effort into something for months and months and months on end. Um, Especially if you find it really interesting or fascinating. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. If it's interesting, I'll dive in. That's why like the short video lessons is my new thing. I'm super pumped about that. And so I put a lot of effort into learning about that and um, that sort of thing. Or when I built my website, you know, I got really into WordPress and how to do all the coding and stuff. And when I played guitar, when I learned how to play jazz, like that sort of ticked my ADHD brain over. And it was like, well, this is it for a while. <laughs> and I got to just absorb myself in it. Um, and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. while it's you know, I don't think it's a, it's a benefit to anybody to have ADHD. It's, it's definitely, um, there are huge negatives to, to dealing with it. Uh, I think that it, it has had a major, um, positive effect on me in those moments when it's done the, the positive side of things. And then when I can't sit still or do things or, you know, whatever, it's the negative side of things. That's not great, but it is kind of like a superpower. I can just turn like, I can't just turn it on. I can kind of steer it, but um, when it does click, it's like, wow, I can get an enormous amount of work done and, you know, learn about something so fast, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's kind of cool, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that definitely has two sides to that coin. <laughs> if it's, if it's firing well, it's great. If it's not, it's, it's, it's a tough time. So, so when it's not working in your favor, it's like, honey, strap on the snowshoes. I mean, and let's go for, a, for a yeah, hike. Basically. Right? Yeah, I, yeah, that's why I do a lot of exercising, weightlifting and stuff is I try to basically tire my brain out as much as I can. Cause when it's kind of a bit tired, that's when it's, it focuses more. Um, so my, yeah, so I, I've gotten to, to, learn, to know my brain pretty intimately <laughs> over the years, uh, with right. dealing with the ADHD and therapy and all sorts of stuff. And that's been very helpful. Um, but yeah, when it's firing, it's, it's a superpower. And I, I think a lot of people with ADHD might agree with that. Um, but when it's not firing in the right direction, it can be, it could be not great. So it's that kind of, it's, it's hit or miss. <laughs> you know? Cool. cool. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, thank yeah. you for sharing that. I'm sure that a lot of people find that interesting. Is there anything that your followers or any of your students, your online students or anybody that know that's around you in your sort of circle of influence, I guess you could say, would be surprised to know about you that they probably don't. Hmm. Well, this would be kind of surprising because I, I don't play a lot of sports, but when I was in elementary school, I did score the game winning basket at the final second to win the city basketball championship for Sault Ste. Marie. <laughs> so that's my, that, that was the peak of my athletic prowess is I scored the ga game winning show. It was my only two points of the game, but I scored the right two right. points. And, and you were it. a hero for the 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was a hero for like a week at, and a grade eight and that was it. And then everyone forgot about it. Right. <laughs> but that was it. And, and so. I, and, and, uh, 
And uh, I like how you said grade eight because I've been living in the U.S. for so yeah, long. Everyone grade. says eighth grade, not grade <laughs> yeah, eight. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, do you have anything that you want to plug? Um, I have my album. My, my first album comes out on Tuesday. Okay. Um, so I, re I wrote it and recorded it uh, here in Sault Ste. Marie after I moved back. It's called Homecoming. It'll be available on all the streaming platforms on Tuesday. It's just solo jazz guitar. Um, and it's kind of cool. I got to I got to re-meet someone that I grew up with. Like he grew up across the street from me, Dustin Jones. Uh, and he went off and did, he was in a band called Inner City Surfers and they played like Warp Tour and toured all around and did the kind of punk rock thing. And then he came back about 10 years ago and resettled in the Sioux and opened up a recording studio at his house. Um, I got to meet Justin again. I haven't seen him in 30 years or so. And every Thursday morning we get together and we record and, uh, I finished the first album and we got it all mixed and mastered. I'm working on my second, but that, yeah, but the first record comes out next Tuesday, April 4th. So. Well, that's great that I reached out to you at right around the right time <laughs> for this interview. Exactly. That's great. <laughs> well, I encourage everyone to, uh, visit mwgcourses.com and just check it out. If not sign up. And uh, and definitely check out Matt's album when it comes out. Thanks for doing this interview, Matt. Yeah, no problem, Adam. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Cool. First heard Lenny, uh, which would be about 1975, there was almost nothing known about the guy unless you lived in Winnipeg or Toronto. I think one or two uh, magazine articles about Lenny in Guitar Player Magazine, and it gave a little bit of an outline to his life, uh, but not much. Uh, 